with nature reviews. Okay. Um, Sorry, we just started the recording of the seminar. Okay. Thank yes. You. Um, okay. So um, presenting today, that's what I'm trying to say here the review paper that I wrote on pre-Cenozoic cyclostratigraphy, or if, I mean, I didn't want to call it deep time cyclostratigraphy because deep time is a very vague concept, pre-Cenozoic cyclostratigraphy and paleoclimate responses to astronomical forcing. So we're going to dive into deep time, but of course we need to start with Milankovitch theory um, in itself. And, and Milankovitch theory, sensu stricto, um, refers to the Quaternary Ice Ages, right? Milankovitch um, got his scientific um, um, results by solving the mystery uh, around the alternations between um, glacials and interglacials um, throughout the Pleistocene. And so what Milankovitch correctly identified are these um, minima in incoming solar radiation during summer and it's when the incoming solar radiation during summer is low, that is where uh, the astronomical configuration that is favorable for glacial periods, because those are the configurations that have little melting at high latitudes of the ice um, during summer. So you need to limit the amount of melting during summer to have an ice age. When you have a lot of melting during um, summer, then you have an uh, interglacial or a warm period. So since Milankovitch, so Milankovitch was 1940, since Milankovitch, uh, several things happened, of course, in geoscience. Two things that happened was the emergence of ocean drilling um, in, the, in the 1960s, and also the success of isotope geochemistry. And if you combine those two, then you... Uh, then you... Are, in fact, able to apply stable isotope geochemistry to benthic foraminifera from deep sea sediment cores. And that is the data that um, was fundamental for constructing um, reference, paleoclimate reference um, records, like here the Megas flies, but you can also think about the Cenogrid paper published by, by Thomas Westerholt, really providing the backbone of Cenozoic climate in response to astronomical forcing. And with this slide, I don't want to say that all paleoclimate questions in the Cenozoic have been solved. However, the publication of Cenogrid has been a big step, at, in, at least in terms of stratigraphy um, and in terms of constraining or in, in terms of quantifying the different responses to um, astronomical forcing during the ice house, cool house, warm house, and hot house of the Cenozoic. So that brings me to the next frontier in cyclostratigraphy, and that is the pre-Cenozoic. So now time is no longer uh, going from the left to the right, but now time is going from the right to the left. We have the Cambrian here, we have the Cenozoic here, and so here you have the Cenogrid curve. This is the benthic isotope curve. And I supplemented the Cenozoic with a temperature reconstruction for the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic. And so the, the, the reason why pre-Cenozoic cyclostratigraphy is a different ballgame compared to Cenozoic cytostatigraphy is because of three reasons. First reasons, first reason is paleogeography, of course. If you go back to the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic, you are confronted with things as uh, supercontinents or configurations where all the continents are concentrated in the Southern Hemisphere. Second reason why it's a different ballgame than the Cenozoic is just the amplitude of climate change. Um, if you take the difference between the hothouse of the Cretaceous and the ice house here of the Carboniferous, you have an amplitude of more than 30 degrees Celsius, which is much more than the amplitude that uh, we have between uh, the early Eocene climatic optimum and the Pleistocene glaciers. So higher climate amplitude, second reason. And the third reason is that um, we do not have astronomical solutions for the pre -Cenozoic. What do I mean with astronomical solutions? Well, as you know, astronomers can calculate the shape of the Earth's orbit back in time, or the inclination of the Earth's uh, rotational axis, or the orientation of the Earth's rotational axis. And, and the, the most stable parameter of those 
astronomical parameter, so the Milankovitch parameters, is um, eccentricity. And what, what I show you here, this spaghetti plot is, is, is showing um, a number of different eccentricity solution and their difference in phase between the different solutions. So you see for the Sinozoic, they all agree according to their phase. What does that mean? That means that all the different solutions, they go up and down in agreement, right? They are in phase. They have a phase difference of zero in the Sinozoic. That's why they are all here all together. But then once we get into the Mesozoic, you see that they start to diverge. So that means that at the same time, so for example, at 100 million years ago, some solutions are at a maximum and another solution is at a minimum. So they are, they are completely going um, out of phase. They are disagreeing on exactly when did we have an eccentricity minimum and an eccentricity maximum. Why is that important? That is important because then if we identify a maximum in the geological record or a minimum in the geological record, we can no longer correlate it with a specific ma maximum or minimum in the solution because we don't know which solution is correct. They are all out of phase, so they're all telling a different story. So three challenges, paleoclimate. Um, so th those are the three reasons, sorry. So those are the three reasons why Cenozoic cyclostatigraphy and pre cenozoic cyclostatigraphy are Two different ball games: tectonics, climate amplitude, and um, and a astronomical solution being available, yes or no. And I will also talk about those three challenges in more detail throughout my talk. And I will start with paleoclimate. So paleoclimate, it's really the, the task of a paleoclimatologist working on the pre cenozoic to understand the state-specific Earth system response to astronomical forcing and to illustrate that um, ambition. I'm going to compare in the next slide the um, late Devonian, where's my, yeah, the late Devonian here, uh, hot house, or oh, sorry, warm house, the late Devonian warm house, and we're going to compare it to the Carboniferous ice house. So, what do we see if we look at um, astronomically resolve, resolved um, records from the Devonian? We see that they are mostly in response to monsoonal dynamics here in the US or in Europe um, or in uh, the north of Gondwana here or in southern China. Most of the records are showing precession response in response to more uh, precipitation when the earth is um, close to the sun during summer or less intense monsoon response when the earth is far away from the sun during summer. So it's a, a relatively direct response of the monsoonal system here to the force. That completely changes in the Carboniferous. Here we have the Mississippi and Pennsylvanian transition within, uh, within the um, Carboniferous. And this is the time of the big cyclotep, right? The big long-term um, high amplitude uh, sea level changes. And those sea level changes, they occur on much longer time scales. They occur on time scales of um, eccentricity, 100 and 400,000 year eccentricity. So there is a kind of, that's what I call a low pass earth system response to astronomical forcing. We do find many less records that respond to precession and obliquity. And we do find more records, sea level driven records that are driven by um, eccentricity. And so that is here again, um, an example of an earth system that is responding much closer or much more similarly to work uh, in comparison to our Pleistocene um, um, Earth system. And that's why I wrote here a nonlinear response of the Earth's climate carbon cycle. Think about uh, permafrost and the methane stored there, cryosphere and the, the, the water stored in ice sheets that is uh, making for the eustatic um, sea level change. That nonlinear response isn't fully understood and it's analogous to the 100,000 year kilo year uh, the 100,000 year problem of the Pleistocene. In the next couple of slides, I want to focus on the Devonian again, because also in the Devonian, right? You uh, you remember I, I I told you that for the Devonian we had this quite direct response to um, precession to monsoonal precipitation, one to one response, short term response. However, that is not entirely true. 
And that is because uh, we have occasionally, we have these black shale, global black shale occurrences in the Devonian record. Every time we have a, a black um, stripe here, it's a, a black shale deposition or an episode of black shale deposition that you can trace globally. For example, the Kelwaster um, okay. that, will, that will ring a bell for you or the Hangenberg event at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. And if you if you line them all up along uh, against time here for the middle and the late Devonian, you see that they're they might give you an impression of having some kind of a cyclical stacking pattern. And that and and going after that question whether there is a Milankovitch influence behind this occurrence of black shale deposition during the Devonian, that is the topic of Dina Witterand's PhD thesis. Her research question is, were Devonian ocean anoxic events based by astronomical forcing, more specifically by long-term eccentricity forcing? To answer that question, she studied a section that's called the Winsenberg section here in Germany, the Winsenberg section. And why did we select that section? Because it contains the Kelwasser event. So here you have the lower Kelwasser event, and here you have the upper Kelwasser event. And you can also see lithologically, lithological cyclicity in centimeter to decimeter scale, right? You see that here. That cyclicity is, of course, also expressed in the geochemistry. We measure silica over calcium ratios that follow, of course, the lithology. And you see there is um, that cyclicity that is in the lithology is also expressed in this proxy. And the interpretation of that proxy is rather straightforward. More silica means more detrital input. More calcium means less detrital input. We also measured titanium and alum aluminum with uh, XRF. And uh, if we take the ratio, if, um, we can use this as some kind of a grain size proxy, where when we have more titanium, we in interpret that as wetter phases and more aluminum are as drier phases relatively more aluminum compared to titanium, of course, not absolutely, but relatively, right? Because they're both detrital elements, right? And the same game or the same um, kind of um, ratio between two detrital proxies can be done between potassium and aluminum. And that is a proxy for the type of weathering that is taking place in the hinterland on the continent. When this axis is reversed, it's an inverse axis. So when there is, more aluminum, we have intensified chemical weathering here in the blue shades, and there's more potassium here, the orange, there is weaker chemical weathering. And if you look on the on, on these long-term time scales, right, everything seems to work relatively fine. When we have more detrital input, it corresponds right here, the more blue colors, more detrital input corresponds to wetter phases. And during wetter phases, we have more chemical weather weathering. That that is functioning as, as you might expect. It's wetter um, and, and, and it's wetter, so there is more detrital input, it's wetter, so there's more chemical weathering and vice versa. That is on the long-term time scale. Um, here you see the time scale here on the, on the, on the y-axis here, so on the time scales of several hundred thousands of years. However, when we zoom in into individual limestone marl poplets, which are interpreted to be precession driven, we see exactly the opposite. When we have a lot of silica and a lot of titanium, so when we have wet phases, right? If you follow this blue peak here, this blue peak here lines up with this blue peak here. So wet phases, high titanium, high silica. Well, actually they line up with um, maxima, so a lot, of, a lot of potassium relative to aluminum in, uh, in the potassium over aluminum uh, ratio, and that means less chemical weathering. So we have, on processional timescales, we have the opposite. We have less chemical weathering during wet phases. And one way to um, explain that um, is um, by the fact that if you increase the monsoon, if you intensify the monsoon during a precession minimum uh, maximum. So that means when the earth is close to the sun during the wet season. So when the wet season gets even wetter, that is um, that is a time where you, um, of course, get a lot of detrital input, right? 
a lot of detrital input and a lot of um, uh, titanium, so a, a high grain size, so wetter climate. When you get the wetter climate, in according to this climate modeling result that I published already uh, 10 years ago, according to this uh, modeling result, well, this intensified monsoon response will consume a lot of latent heat. Like, and that latent heat that is used for um, the evaporation and the, and the condensation for of, of, of water, of, of precipitation, makes that the surface temperature, so here you see the stimulated temperature, is actually cooler during such a configuration. And as you know, if you have cooler temperatures, then you also have less efficient chemical weathering. So this, we're still debating what is the what what is the true reason, but this is one of our hypotheses that is actually the latent heat effect that uh, reduces the temperature here over the tropical continent, the Euro-American continent you have here. And that is this temperature increase when it's wet, so it's cool and wet, um, that uh, decreases chemical weathering actually on processional time scale. Okay, now we go back to the long-term time scales, to the eccentricity time scale. So we can subdivide our record in three parts. Here we have the lower Kelwasser event. It's relatively dry, but highly variable. Then we have this interval between the Kelwasser events, which was wet and with a lot of chemical weathering, and there, but also lower amplitude cycles here. So stable climate. And then we have, uh, again, the uh, upper Kelwasser and the, the interval above, which was dry and highly variable climate. And this sequence of climate regimes is actually in good agreement with an hypothesis that I formulated uh, in 2017, which I call the eccentricity minimum hypothesis. And that is, um, that. and to start that hypothesis, I want to start here uh, with a 2.4 million year eccentricity node. So, so the eccentricity of the Earth act of the Earth's uh, orbit has different cycles. You know the 100,000 year cycle, you know the 400,000 year cycle. There's also the very long 2.4 million year cycle. And during such a 2.4 million year cycle minimum or a node, that's the same thing, the precession cycles are of low amplitude. As you can see here, the amplitude is here relatively low for a prolonged period of time compared to before or after. And I assume that such a minimum corresponds to this time here, the wet and stable time. And during this time, you have a wet and stable um, climate regime during which soils and regolith can develop on the continent and can grow to relatively thick thicknesses. Of course, that this development of the regolith makes that there is a lot of nutrient and a lot, a lot of nutrients stored on the continent. And then when we get out of this 2.4 million year minimum and we get back to this high amplitude uh, cycles in here, uh, more eccentric orbits, eccentricity maximum, that means that you can have this intensified monsoons again. Intensified, intensified summer monsoon, with increased rain, increased runoff, and therefore an erosion of the regolith and a flux of nutrients, especially phosphorus, towards the oceans, and eutrophication and uh, black shale deposition in the ocean. And um, of course, uh, you have here, uh, when you go back to these high amplitude cycles, you have precession maximum, precession minima, so you also need some nutrient recycling of phosphorus, but I will not go into uh, those details in order to make that you have continued black shale deposition over several hundred thousands of years, which has the, been the case for the upper Kelwasser event. This idea that we proposed for the late Devonian is not new. Um, it's actually inspired by publications that have been made by different authors on Oceanographic Event 2 at the Sindemanian Turonian. Uh, boundary where we actually have the same configuration. You see here an eccentricity node being proposed just prior to the carbon cycle perturbation. Here it is oceanographic event two in the Devonian it's the upper Kelwasser. But the node makes that you have this period of climate stability during which you develop a very thick regolith because of the climate stability. And that thick regolith acts as some kind of as a nutrient gun, I want to say. It's, it's a gun being loaded during the note and then being released when 
we go back to high eccentricity configurations here, and that nutrient is released, eutrophication and um, ocean um, oxygen defici deficiency. So that is a bit the stage uh, of paleoclimate research that we are doing here in Münster um, for the Devonian. Now I wanna go uh, more towards a stratigraphic um, point of view, really integrated stratigraphy with um, cyclostratigraphy and Milankovitch cycles as a big part of integrated stratigraphy next to biostratigraphy, magnetostratigraphy, lithostratigraphy, and so on. And I want to make a case here for the importance of repeated cyclostratigraphic studies for the same stratigraphic interval from a global perspective. And, and that it's only true consistent results all, everywhere on the planet that we can go towards a Paleozoic and Mesozoic um, cyclostratigraphic constraint time scale. And here I'm going to give you again the um, example of the late Devonian uh, mass extinction, so the Prenian Permanian boundary. Here we have the lower Kelwasser positive isotope excursion, and here we have the upper Kelwasser positive isotope excursion that we can recognize globally. Now, the, the question is how much time is there between the onset of the lower Kelwasser? and the onset of the upper Kelwasser positive isotope excursion. And you can see that different authors come to different numbers. And Nina, the, the work that I presented uh, by Nina, they, she came on uh, 900,000 years. Uh, and Christine da Silva, 670. I was around 700, 500, 450. And then here, Chinese worker on a much longer time scale. And you see those numbers differ. And that is OK that they differ. The most important thing is that all these authors, except for one, agree that uh, that you, we can group this stratigraphic interval, this chemostratigraphic interval, in three 400,000 year eccentricity cycles. So the, every one of the blue marked authors agrees that the lower Kelwasser um, positive isotope excursion occurs in cycle 15. Then there is one cycle in between the lower Kelwasser and the upper Kelwasser, that's cycle 16 here, and then the upper Kelwasser occurs in cycle 17. Everyone agrees on that except Ma, so that is the path of consensus that most probably this is the correct stratigraphic um, framework, stratigraphic framework for the Kelwasser interval. And that is important if we want to make our way towards a fully cyclostratigraphically constrained, astrochronologically constrained time scale for the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic. Be and why is that important? That is because um, we need to go in the direction of um, the implementation of astrochronosomes. So what are astrochronosomes? Astrochronosomes are just subdividing the stratigraphic records in zones that each, that each corresponds to a cycle of 405,000 year eccentricity. So you, we, the, the way it works is you start counting back from the present into the, in the geological past. And you see here that um, for the Cenozoic Mesozoic boundary, you find cycles in the geological record. And it's very easy to correlate these cycles in the geological record to their corresponding astrochronosome. So this is the 405,000 year cycle in eccentricity the 164th cycle since the present, or before the present, I have to say. So everyone agrees in everyone agrees in stratigraphy that the Cenozoic Mesozoic boundary, so the KT boundary, occurs in astrochronosome 164. This cycle is corresponds to astrochronosome 165, and then 166. If we go deeper in time, I told you what is the problem of the pre cenozoic is that the different solutions, because these are astronomical solutions, they start to disagree on their phasing, right? Here in the, at the KT boundary, they still go up and down nicely together. Well, this is how it looks like when they disagree on the phase. So why is that important? Why do we now need to go to turn to the, to the geological record? Well, we need to, identify in the geological record all the 405,000 year cycles between the present and the Mesozoic and Paleozoic boundary to count in the stratigraphic record whether there are 623 or 624 astrochronosomes. 623 or 624 
405,000 year eccentricity cycles between the present and the Mesozoic and Paleozoic boundary. So that will, of course, um, require multiple sections being correlated, multiple psychostratigraphies being correlated and concatenated so to make a time continuous psychostratigraphic framework. And then we will be able to say to the astronomers that at 500, uh, sorry, at 251.8 million years ago, uh, which is the Mesozoic Paleozoic boundary, very well dated, we can tell them, well, this solution with 624 is unrealistic, or this solution with 623 is unrealistic because we know that there are so many astrochronosomes between this boundary and the present. Okay. You might now think, well, that is very boring and very stratigraphic. I mean, that is in interesting for stratigraphers, but who cares? Who cares? about stratigraphy in the end. Well, it's about much more than just stratigraphy. Reading time in the geological record by means of cyclostratigraphy is important um, as also to put, or also to, to learn lessons from about our, to learn lessons from our, about our Earth system from the geological record. To illustrate that, I show you here the end Permian Delta 13C excursion from the Meishan section, the GSSP section in China. So we are again here at uh, the Mesozoic Paleozoic boundary. And we see here, um, when now time is going from the left to the right again, we see here a negative carbon isotope excursion and then a recovery. And, and the time scale of this is constrained by cyclostratigraphy. And so everyone agrees that this negative isotope excursion is due to a rapid injection of isotopically negative carbon into the atmosphere. Well, that sounds very familiar because that is exactly what we as humans are doing right now as well. We're injecting um, fossil fuel negative carbon into the, well, by burning fossil fuel, we're injecting isotopically negative um, carbon isotopes in the, in the atmosphere. So I compare the Meishan Delta 13C record with a model simulation of surface ocean Delta 13C in the dissolved inorganic carbon, right? On the same y-axis, minus three to three for Meishan, minus three to three for this simulation in orange. And the simulation in orange is simulating the response of dissolved inorganic carbon, well, the isotopic response of dissolved inorganic carbon in response to um, a simulation in which you put in, in, in which we reach a, a peak concentration of 800 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere by the year uh, 2150. What we see here is that in our simulation, our Delta 13C um, is rebounding much, much faster compared to the Meishan and Fermian example. So that means that in the real world, in the Meishan and Permian real world, there were apparently a lot of additional feedback loops, positive feedback loops that made that the recovery went slower than the recovery that is anticipated here in the simulation. And that is of course, because many of those feedback loops are probably missing from the numerical climate simulator that we used here to use the orange line. So that is my plea for the importance of astrochronosomes and cyclostratigraphy for reading time in the pre-Cenozoic. And then I want to end uh, my seminar with um, approaching pre-Cenozoic cyclostratigraphy as the new frontier in, um, in cyclostratigraphic research from an astronomical point of view. And what does that mean? That is really using the geological record to reconstruct Earth-Moon dynamics. As I said, until now, the astronomers calculated their solution and they provided them to us. Their, they provided us with their solutions and we were calibrating our record towards their solutions. But now if you go deeper back in time, actually the astronomers have very poorly constrained solution. And we can, we can extract from the geological record information on earth moon dynamics and fundamental frequencies that we can give to the astronomers so we can turn around the game. We can provide, as geologists, we can provide information to astronomers that they can use to calibrate their models with. And I'm going to give you examples from four different intervals here. I will start with the Eocene and then 
uh, go to the Mesozoic, the Devonian, and then even all the way back to the Paleo Archean. First things first, um, I have to um, introduce you uh, to two very important concepts, or actually three very important concepts in terms of astronomy. Basically, to calculate obliquity, precession, eccentricity, astronomers only need three frequencies. That, and those are called G frequencies, S frequencies, and the precession constant P. So what are S frequencies? S frequencies is um, measuring the tilt of, for example, the Earth's orbit is not just parallel to Jupiter's orbit, right? The Earth's orbit is inclined with respect to Jupiter, Jupiter's um, orbit. And that inclination is not always the same. That inclination is also changing with a certain frequency. And that frequency with which the Earth's elliptical plane is changing relative to that of Jupiter, that's the S term. That S term is going to influence obliquity and eccentricity. And then the G frequencies. The G frequencies, as you can see here on the slide, that's the frequency with which the orbit of the Earth itself is orbiting. Um, it's rotating um, um, in the ellipt ecliptic plane. And then the precession constant has to do with the tidal dissipation of the um, Earth's rotational energy. So as you know, the Earth's rotate is rotating and it's thereby experiencing friction of ocean water, for example. And by the tides, it's the, the rotation of the uh, Earth is, all, is, is actually, there, the tides work as a brake. It's, it's, it's being slowed down. The rotation of the Earth is being slowed down by the friction with the ocean. And because there is preservation of um, angular momentum in the Earth-Moon system, if the Earth's rotational speed slows down, then the moon needs to move further away from the Earth in order to maintain angular momentum, right? And so that is the speed at which that occurs will determine how fast the precession constant P is changing. We'll come to that later. And so as I said, actually, we can reconstruct those G terms, those S terms, and that P term from the geological records. And I personally, I got excited by this topic by working on this Eocene Ocean Drilling Sedimentary Archive. This is a wonderful, excellent signal-to-noise record with a data point every 800 years or so over um, 16 million years. Uh, where we have uh, calcium over iron ratios with very nice cycles in there and uh, benthic delta 13c, benthic delta 18o you know, uh, records. And so thanks to that excellent signal to noise ratio, we were able not only to identify precession peaks, but to identify each and every different precession component. So precession is, uh, made, is, is um, made up by different Procession components, and that is uh, because it's uh, procession is the result of the interaction of that procession parameter p and the different g terms. So here you see g1 is related uh, to Mercury, the first planet. G2 is the g frequency of Venus. G3 is the g frequency of Earth. G4 the g frequency of Mars, and so on. So you see the different procession terms. Are all is this interaction between the precession, precession comp, the precession parameter, and the G terms, and we could identify them in the power spectrum of calcium over iron. The same for um, hundred thousand year eccentricity, four hundred thousand year eccentricity, and obliquity. And based on that, we could basically reconstruct for the Middle Eocene G one, G two, G three, and G four, and compare it to the Lascar astronomical solutions and say um, where the uh, solution is doing a good job and where the solution is uh, not hitting the observation. Here you see our reconstruction of the precession constant. As I said, precession constant is um, connected to the, the, the tidal dissipation 
And so what, what, if you put my reconstruction here for the, for the Eocene 42 million years ago, together with different uh, reconstructions by other authors here uh, from the literature, you see that actually um, um, the precession constant was not going down linearly uh, as suggested here by the different astronomical models, but more likely it had a, a pathway where the precession constant was relatively flat in the paleogene. So that means that tidal dissipation was not as strong as it is now. And then a uh, speed up of tidal dissipation uh, of, uh, of energy. So the, the earth being slowed down more rapidly during the neogene when there was actually ice on the planet. So that's probably the connection between the two. On Paleozoic timescale, this kind of, uh, you can play the same game, right? So the, exactly the same way as we did it for the Eocene, ground truthing, uh, and uh, you can do it the same thing for the, for the, um, as for the Eocene. And that is important because that is needed to ground truth rapid variations in the lunar orbital distance and precession constant that are suggested by some models. So you see here some models for the, for the Cenozoic, the models all suggest a linear behavior However, on longer time scales, this is the four hot model. You see the four hot model that uh, uh, is saying that there are periods where there was a lot of tidal dissipation, like for example, here in the Carboniferous and periods of uh, low tidal di dissipation, for example, here in the early Paleozoic. And well, by, uh, by getting these data points from the geological record, this one is from the Devonian, this one I collaborated on, uh, we can actually ground through this astronomical model. And actually this astronomical model is fitting the data rather well. If we increase the time scales even further to the, um, to the origin of the earth, uh, so to say to the, earth, to, the, to the earliest sedimentary records, we um, go back to Precambrian times and we um, um, often in the literature um, are referred to um, the Moody's group. The Moody's group is a formation, sedimentary formation in South Africa, the oldest well-preserved cliticlastic tidal deposits on Earth. And this data point is based on a, a tidal deposit uh, right there, and uh, the Earth-Moon distance reconstruction based on the tidal deposit. But I think we can do better in the future, and that is because recently, like uh, last year, ICDP drilled kilometers of core in a rhythmic sedimentation on depth scales of several meters, several tens of meters, with a potential Milankovitch imprint. So we, we then we don't need to look at the tidal lines, but we can look at the Milankovitch imprint to reconstruct that Earth-Moon distance 3.3 billion years ago. And, and, and here as a, some kind of a um, um, uh, proof of concept, because this is uh, work that was just funded by the DFG, so work that still needs to be done. But this is the proof of concept I, I showed in the in the proposal to 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 ask ourselves the research question: Is there a Milankovitch signal on the meter scale in those 3.3 billion year old alternations between banded iron formations and sandstones? And so you can see here the downhole logging record um, in natural gamma radiation, where um, I speculate that these meter scale cycles might be uh, precession and these uh, tens of meters of uh, meter cycles could be short eccentricity. In fact, I was with a bachelor student uh, in the core repository and we confirmed that these fluctuations in gamma radiation are actually fluctuations in clay content and potassium content. And more, uh, more importantly, if we look at iron over silica, we see very nicely, uh, um, very nicely expressed um, cycles at the order of five meters, which could be actually precession cycles, but we need to do many more statistical analyses to confirm that. And But if they are precession cycles, we can use those to reconstruct the P frequency, right? The tidal dissipation of the earth, as well as the different G terms to reconstruct eccentricity. And with that information, if we really manage to get that information, we can go back to the astronomers and provide them a target all the way back in Earth history that their models need to fit in order to be reliable. That is, I think, maybe the most important frontier for cytostography because it has impact 
on many different um, areas, paleoclimate research, stratigraphic research, and astronomy. And with that, I'm at the end of my um, seminar. Thank you for your attention. And I'm, of course, happy to take any questions. OK, thank you, David. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. <laughs> A lot, a lot, uh, a lot uh, given by you. Uh, anybody has any questions? By the way, you have this camera on my name that uh, that uh, or I'm yeah. without the name that shows you the class. Anybody has any questions? I think I think it's a bit overwhelming. Okay, I, I, I think I have a question. Um, uh, and that is, uh, you talked at the beginning about the climbing effects and you were, you were talking about the, the concentration of uh, the, the concentration of the signal to the monsoon signal. Yep. Uh, right, and I didn't quite completely understand it because you're looking at some belt within the earth, but is it, is it a sampling issue or is this really a climatic, uh, a full global climatic signal? Because it looks like there are many areas on the earth that don't correspond to the monsoonal area. It's still yeah. the earth was distributed to the poles. Um, yes, exactly. Um, very good observation. Um, what 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 is happening is of of course there um, um, of course there are uh, high latitude areas that are not exposed to that um, monsoonal circulation. However, for the Devonian, what seems to be the case is that the global carbon cycle dynamics are mostly following a precession signature. And the precession signature is, of course, um, um, originating from the monsoon system. Because we are in the Devonian, it's a, it's a relatively warm climate state. Also, the, the, the latitudinal range of the ITCZ is very large. And even in the southern hemisphere, it can penetrate into um, Gondwana. Um, and that is, of course, very important if you think about this, this, this very early Paleozoic uh, well, there's very, very early vegetated continental environments where the, the amount of precipitation there um, is is crucial to allow for precipitation, yes or no, and therefore for the global carbon cycle, right? It's it's all. I mean, the the way you 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 propagate that um, precessional signal towards the high latitude is through the global carbon cycle, because the global carbon cycle is will determine how much CO2 ends up in the atmosphere, how big, how, ma how many ppm CO2 there is in the atmosphere. And that will in turn determine um, the climate at the high latitudes as well, because CO2 is, is global. So that's a little bit the connection. And so the, the, the big difference between the Devonian and the Carboniferous is that in the Devonian, the most important process in the global carbon cycle is the monsoonal circulation. However, in the, in the Carboniferous, it's the extent of ice volume and storage of methane in, um, in permafrost environment. And apparently monsoons are have a much shorter response time to the astronomical forcing compared to ice sheets and um, permafrost. That's, a, that's the idea. Thank you. Um, another question, maybe touching your last point and, and maybe the greatness. Uh, basically, you were talking about uh, the, the different factors uh, in, in the astronomical cycling uh, as if they were, uh, well, uh, in the perspective of today. But overall, over this uh, large period of time, we, we have dissipation of energy and expansion of the universe. You, can you say a couple of words on how we see that, or do we see the yeah the, what happens over all this time to to Earth? Yeah. Well, that's a, a question I get very often. Um, 
how do we know there was even something like precession in the Devonian, for example? Well, I mean, this, as, as long as you have the main gravitational bodies in our solar system in place, you have those, um, those gravitational interactions between, but, um, because as you, as you could see, these um, G terms and these S terms, they were all, it was G1, G2, G3, G4, G5. Those refer to the biggest, biggest masses in our solar system, Mercury, um, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and so on. And they were there since the beginning of our solar system. So they have been there actually um, for 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 um, the entire Earth history that we can study from the rock record, right? Even if we go back billions of years ago, while well, Mercury and Venus were already in their orbit at that time, and that is that is what makes the that is what triggers the Milankovitch cycles on Earth. So yes, we can be uh, very sure that there was something like precession, obliquity. And eccentricity um, um, in the Precambrian and in the in the early Paleozoic. The question is, or the question that we need to resolve as cyclostratigraphers is, what was the what was the exact periodicity and the phasing, so that we can use that to reconstruct G terms, S terms, and the p frequency to provide that information to the astronomers. Um, it's a little bit like. Um, if, if I always compare these models of astronomers to weather models, weather forecast models, you know, like it's it's relatively easy to predict the weather for the next two or three days. But then if you look uh, at the, the forecast for the next 14 days, there is some kind of a point where the forecasts diverge, right? Where the, all the forecasts diverge in, as a spaghetti. Well, as a, as a our, our task as geologists is to say, well, in in 14 days, actually it's gonna be sunny, right? And then you know which one of the forecasts are more reliable than the others. And that's the same that we now need to do with the astronomers because it's the same chaos effect that is making those models to diverge. If we can provide them with a target data point, well, we can reduce the chaos in their, it's not forecast, it's their reconstructions, of course, but. Um, I think with the analogy of the weather forecast is a is is a very nice one. It's the butterfly effect, basically. Yes. Any more questions, anybody? No. Okay. So, uh, David, I I want to thank you for this uh, seminar. I'm sorry for all the problems at the beginning. Uh, no worries. But uh, and and I will be happy to to meet you again sometime soon. Uh, Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Yeah, yeah, yeah.